Good evening, and welcome to Spotlight, a weekly series of investigative reports from around the world. I'm Mark Hertzgard in San Francisco, and tonight the spotlight is on biological weapons and the CIA. Remember the anthrax scare? Shortly after the September 11 terrorist attacks, Americans were frightened anew when packets of anthrax were mailed to a handful of journalists and members of Congress. Eighteen months later, just where that anthrax came from remains a mystery. But the most likely source, say investigators, is the U.S. government itself. The American military's work in this field began during World War II in response to Nazi Germany's pursuit of biological weapons. After the war, the U.S. effort expanded to include experiments with LSD. Years before it became part of the 60s counterculture, LSD was being administered by the CIA, not only to loosen the lips of prisoners under interrogation, but to test the battlefield reactions of unsuspecting American soldiers. Tonight's film tells the story of a CIA agent who helped run these covert programs and may have been murdered because of it. In 1953, Frank Olson plunged to his death from a 13th floor hotel window in New York City. The CIA man who was in the room with Olson said he jumped. An autopsy demanded 40 years later by Olson's son concluded he was pushed. I'll be back afterwards with an update. For now, here is Codename Artichoke. Frederick, Maryland. More than 40 years after his death, the body of former CIA scientist Dr. Frank Olson has been exhumed. Olson's son Eric is convinced his father was murdered by agents of the American government because he wanted to leave the CIA. Dr. Frank Olson was an expert for anthrax and other biological weapons and had top security clearance. Forensic pathologists at George Washington University performed an autopsy and concluded that Olson probably was the victim of a violent crime. I was very strongly identified with him. I loved him. Um, and I'm sure that's why you know, I, in the end, I came to, you know, take on this task of trying to figure out what had become of him. It's been eight years since the exhumation. Eric Olson is still searching for the reasons behind his father's death in November of 1953. Eric was nine years old at the time. It's a quest he inherited as the oldest of three children to solve the mystery of their father's death. My real memories of my father are not not very, you know, many or very clear because the, the, the trauma have, of his death really kind of darkened a lot of, a lot of these memories. His death was, uh, you know, so dark um, and so unmentionable. I mean, uh, after he died, it was just, it was a subject that one couldn't really go near. Eric Olson has returned to live in the house his father built for the family in Frederick in 1950. Back then, Olson Sr. was one of the biochemists responsible for the Biological Weapons Center the U.S. Army ran nearby. The anthrax letters that killed five and caused illness to several others have haunted Eric ever since. Could there be a connection between his father's death five decades ago and the acts of terror taking place today? We've been exposed to anthrax. I don't have anthrax. Confirmation that anthrax killed two Washington postal workers. One man is being nervous these days. Those are the facts. It feels like every time we've been exposed to anthrax. Which serves the White House. 
The deadly disease that frightened America after the terrorist attacks on September 11th seems to have come from the same U.S. Army laboratory in Frederick, where Olson had worked for Dietrich. The Biological Weapons Lab was founded in 1943. At the time, the Americans feared Hitler might attack the Allied troops with a virus or bacteria. They quickly produced a gas mask and anthrax weapons in order to be able to strike back in kind. And chimpanzees, mainly protective masks and clothing that resist bacteria. Dr. Frank Olson, an army captain and one of the first scientists at Fort Dietrich, worked together with Norman Cornoyer. The two became good friends. Their first sons were born within a few days of each other in 1944. We worked about uh, five months in this thing called aerosol, aerosols to see if we could take in uh, test gas masks and impregnated clothing to see how good they were. And then one day he was transferred to uh, working on uh, hot agents. He said, Norm, how about working for me in the hot stuff? That's what we always referred to it. N was anthrax, X was botulism, and so forth. Christmas 1947. The war is finally over. Norman and his family celebrate together with Alice and Frank Olson and their children. Were we close? Yes, very, very close. Every day of the week for two and a half years. So you can expect us to be close. Among the things his father left behind, Eric Olson found some home movies and slides. At first, he didn't pay them much attention, but today he sees that material from a different point of view. Might it contain any indication of the secret anthrax research his father was doing after the war? Frank Olson made a hobby of home movies. These scenes reveal nothing of his secret task involving deadly weapons. They show the perfect world of a young father captured with the latest 8mm camera to hit the market. Afterwards, Frank Olson turned to photography. He brought home a lot of slides from his many travels. His photographs also primarily show private moments. Frank and his wife Alice and son Eric in 1945. Mr. and Mrs. Olson in 1947 with son Eric and daughter Lisa. Christmas 1949 in a tuxedo. Alice had given birth to their third child, Nils, in the meantime. The whole subject of the relationship between a wife and a husband who's doing, you know, top secret and classified work is a, is a subject one could discuss at some length because the wife, I think, develops, you know, uncanny kinds of intuitions about all the things that are not being said and she knows the limits of what she can ask. Um, and for quite a long time, I think, possibly ever since my father began working at Dietrich, actually, that the, the, the whole issue of the monkeys dying was a very delicate matter for him. And when he would come home from work for lunch and have a certain kind of expression, she would immediately know that this meant th that that morning all the monkeys had died, uh, which meant that the experiment had been a success. Arthur Vedic is Frank Olson's brother-in-law. Their families regularly spend their summer vacation together. Vedic remembers Frank Olson as an American patriot who was enthusiastic about working for the Army's biological weapons program. He was a person who believed in what he was doing, who felt that the work that he was doing at the center in Frederick was important for the United States. He considered himself terribly loyal and patriotic person. That kind of an attitude of loyalty was one way of expressing your Americanism. Dr. Frank Olson had worked for the U.S. Army's Biological Weapons Laboratory for exactly 10 years when he died in New York in the wee hours of November 28, 1953. He spent the night at the Hotel Pennsylvania, along with a CIA agent who was there to guard him. 
That night, Frank Olson plunged to his death from his room on the hotel's 13th floor. It was said through a closed window. Niels, the youngest of Olson's three children, scribbled on the clipping with a crayon. I was simply told that, you know, your father has had an accident and he, he's died. And the only detail I was then given was that he, he had fallen or jumped out of a window. Um, and I, I remember quite clearly just being totally um, stupefied by this. Uh, because I, I, as, as a nine-year-old, I was, I was old enough to have some idea of cause and effect. And I, I had no idea, what does it mean to fall out of a window? I mean, how do you fall out of a window in the middle of the night? What is that? You know? Eric didn't understand. And for his mother, the subject of his father's death became a taboo. The search for the circumstances surrounding the mysterious death of Dr. Frank Olson begins in 1945 with the liberation of the concentration camp at Dachau, Germany. American troops discovered the corpses of hundreds of prisoners who had been murdered or starved to death. Many of the survivors told U.S. doctors about cruel experiments the camp's doctors carried out using disease, germs, and various drugs. A few weeks later, at Kanzberg Castle, north of Frankfurt, the scientific elite of Nazi Germany is arrested and questioned by American officers. The name of the project is Operation Dustbin. The American military hopes to evaluate and exploit the findings German researchers made during the war. Among the prisoners at Kanzberg Castle is rocket scientist Professor Hermann Obert, who collects autographs from his colleagues. Some of the leading scientific experts in Nazi Germany had been involved in biological warfare, testing the effects of deadly germs on human beings in Dachau and other concentration camps. One of them was Professor Kurt Blume. Blume was the Third Reich's deputy surgeon general and the man behind German research into biological weapons. Blume will be among those charged in the case against concentration camp doctors brought before the military tribunal in Nuremberg. He will face the death penalty. In spite of the fact that there is enough evidence against him, Kurt Blume will be acquitted in Nuremberg. The Americans have other plans for him. I have here in all openheit bekannt that I ein überzeugter Nationalsozialist und Anhänger Adolf Hitlers gewesen bin. We were interested in, in anyone who did work in biological warfare. Now, did they want to use that, the Nazis? Yes, absolutely. They wanted to use anything that would kill people. Anything. The Americans saved Kurt Blume, seen here on the left, from death by hanging. In turn, he provides them with information about the Nazi biological weapons program. One of the specialists interrogating Bloma is Donald Falconer, a friend and colleague of Frank Olson. Falconer is responsible for developing anthrax bombs. Today, more than 50 years later, Donald Falconer lives in a convalescent home not far from Friedrich. We had quite a number of beings. Well, maybe he came in a lesser... Eric Olson had visited Falconer several times, hoping his father's old friend might one day confide a crucial secret in him. But Falconer refuses to say anything, feeling bound by his military oath, and he doesn't want to be interviewed. In one of his father's films, immediately following images of his grandfather, Eric discovers a sequence that seems to show secret crop dusting flights that took place in 1947. Using the findings of Bloma and other Nazi scientists, the Americans experimented with artificial diseases capable of destroying crops. After this short clip, more family pictures of the children. 
Meanwhile, in Fort Detrick, a massive arms program is taking place with bacteriological weapons, primarily anthrax spores, which have proven to be highly resistant and therefore suitable for biological warfare. Anthrax is cultivated in this building, then placed in bombs. The Americans are concerned about the Soviets' biological arsenal. If the Cold War should ever turn hot, deadly bacteria might be used as weapons. The Army demands ample weapons at the ready. Frank Olson often accompanies the Air Force to test germ warfare in the field, for example on the Caribbean island of Antigua. These tests are carried out to monitor the spread of diseases under realistic conditions. Most of the tests Olson's team carries out in the Caribbean and on the Alaskan tundra deal with relatively harmless bacteria, but some tests are conducted using actual pathogens called hot stuff. We didn't use anthrax, we used Bacillus clebigii, which is very similar on uh, spore as anthrax is. So, to that extent, um, we did do something that was not kosher. Because we picked it up all over. I mean, it was picked up months afterwards. We'd ride in it's an easygoing life they led, but they have a secret mission. In California, Olson and his team drive up the Pacific coast in a yellow convertible to prepare an experiment to take place over San Francisco Bay. Spores will be released in order to test the city's vulnerability to an act of Russian sabotage. Frank Olson loves life and has little interest in following rules. His unconventional manner seems inconsistent with his job working for the army. In October of 1949, Olson is suspected of disclosing government secrets. He is interrogated by military intelligence. Olson was mildly impatient with the questioning conducted during the course of this interview. This attitude is regarded as typical by persons at Dietrich who are acquainted with him. Olson is violently opposed to control of scientific research, either military or otherwise, and opposes supervision of his work. He does not follow orders and has had numerous altercations with MPs. He was uh, very, very open and not as scared to say what he thought. For that matter, to the contrary. He didn't give a damn. Frank Olson pulled no punches at any time. And I don't know, I, I think that uh, that's what they were scared of, I'm sure. He did speak out any time he wanted to. And so, was he going to be caught on this? Could be. Could be. As the scientist responsible for biological warfare experiments, Frank Olson was among the most important holders of confidential information during the Cold War. November 1953. Four years after he was suspected of disclosing secrets, an accusation that was never proved. During a trip to New York, Olson is accompanied by a CIA agent who watches him constantly, never leaving his side. Olson and the CIA agent take a room in the famous Hotel Pennsylvania. So, what are they doing in New York? Armin Pastore is the manager of the hotel. He is on duty that night when Frank Olson falls from the 13th floor, landing on the sidewalk in front of the hotel. He was laying there looking at me, trying to speak to me. A very earnest look in his eyes, you know, wide open. And, but there was blood everywhere. There was blood from his nose, blood from his eyes, blood from his ears. There was a bone protruding from his left arm, sticking straight out. And then uh, we kept trying to speak to him, uh, but we, we were not really communicating because I couldn't understand anything he was saying. And then finally he died. Pastore notifies the police and accompanies them to the 13th floor. In the meantime, he has determined that Olson must have fallen to his death from 1018A and that there was probably another person in the room at the time. Wait a minute, I says. It's possible somebody is in there. And then they became alert and they pulled their guns out. So you open the door, we'll go in. So I, op 
I opened the door with my key and they rushed in. And here this guy was sitting on the, in the commode uh, with his hands on his knees, his head up, hands up to his head. And they said, what happened? Cops said, what happened? He said, I don't know, I just heard a crash of glass. And then I see Frank Olson is out on the street. I looked out the window and he's down in the street. The CIA shadow testifies that he was fast asleep and didn't hear Olson get out of bed. He can offer no explanation for the suicide. He has nothing else to say. He makes no statement regarding the reason the two were visiting New York. The case is closed quickly. No one is interested in the telephone call that someone made from Olson's room immediately following his death. So the operator says, yeah, there was one call out of that room. And I said, yeah. I said, what, what was the conversation? He said, well, the man in the room called this number out in Long Island, and he said, well, he's gone. And the man on the other end said, well, that's too bad. And they both hung up. Was that the CIA agent reporting that he had solved the Frank Olson problem in the Hotel Pennsylvania? Eric Olson in New York. For years now, he's been searching for witnesses who might know something about his father's death, which he considers to be a murder perpetrated by the CIA. He wants to know the motive. Was the government afraid Frank Olson might reveal state secrets? The recent terror attacks involving anthrax were a shock to Eric. Anthrax killed two Washington postal workers. Being nervous these days. Those are the facts. It feels like every time we've been exposed to anthrax, which serves the White House. Eric finds himself wondering about a lot of things. Was the anthrax terrorist one of our own? Is that the reason he hasn't been caught? because he knows something no one else should find out about. A secret his father knew too? In a suburb of New York, Eric Olson meets longtime CIA veteran Ike Feldman. In the 50s, he worked in drug enforcement. At least, that was the official version. Although Feldman never met Eric's father personally, he discovered some information about the circumstances of his death. The source that I had was in the New York City Police Department, it was a Bureau of Narcotic Agents, and it was the CIA agent agents themselves. They all seemed the same, that uh, he was pushed out the window, that he didn't jump. People who wanted him out of the way said that he talked too much, and he was telling people about the things that he'd done, which was American secret. If you work on a top government secret, city secret, state secret, and it spills out to people that you shouldn't know, there's only one way to do it, kill him. In April of 1950, Dr. Frank Olson received a diplomatic passport, unusual for an army scientist. Did he have a new job? In the following years, he traveled often to Europe, including making several trips to Germany. Well, he was a member of the CIA. Uh, I only found this out after he told me about it, because I didn't know it, because to me he was a captain, and that's all I knew about it at first. But it turns out that he was a, a CIA agent, and he stayed on, and he, right on through to 1953. Pictures taken in Frankfurt and Heidelberg will later turn up among Olson slides. These cities were home to the U.S. Army's most important facilities in Germany. There is also a picture of the top-secret CIA headquarters in Germany, located in the building of IG Farben, in the heart of Frankfurt. What is Olson's new assignment? He is now working in an area that has nothing to do with biological weapons. Here, in the German offices of the CIA, the biochemist is conducting important conversations with U.S. intelligence officers.
Increasingly, he can be found in the company of other CIA agents, including a certain John McNulty. It has to do with a top secret project to use chemicals, drugs, and torture on human beings in order to break their will and make them submissive. Brainwashing. The code name for this operation? Artichoke. The team would enjoy the opportunity of applying artichoke techniques to individuals of dubious loyalty, suspected agents or plants, and subjects having known reasons for deception. An Uber Ursel in the Taunus Hills north of Frankfurt, hidden in old half-timbered houses, the U.S. Army led a quiet little interrogation center, Camp King. It was primarily Soviet agents and defectors from East Germany who were kept here. People the CIA considered to be communist spies. Special teams, the so-called rough boys, interrogated the prisoners. Former SS member Franz Gaidosch was hired just after the war by the Americans to tend the bar on the officers' mess at Camp King. Sometime in the year of 1952, in the top secret interrogation center, Gaidosch runs across another German, Professor Kurt Blume. For a long time, Blume was a doctor at Camp King. He also ran the clinic. He was a protege of the Americans and had been a concentration camp doctor. He conducted experiments. The American officers who lived the good life at Camp King aren't disturbed about Bulma's past. Was the former concentration camp doctor expected to lend his experience for their own planned experiments on human beings? A CIA consultant began planning the artichoke experiments as early as September of 1951. The conversations at Ober Ozel pointed up signs and symptoms of drugs that might be used. We should look into the use of amnesia producing drugs. Of course, their methods were not humane. They exerted a lot of pressure. There are ways of breaking people. At Camp King, they were notorious, the rough boys. Anything somebody didn't want to reveal, they would try to get it out of them. There are many indications that the cruel experiments involving human beings, Operation Artichoke, took place in this isolated CIA safe house near Camp King, at the edge of a town called Kohnberg. The former Schuster Villa, now called Haus Waldhof, was built shortly after the turn of the century as the summer residence of a Jewish banking family from Frankfurt. The Nazis confiscated it in 1934, and the Americans took it over after the war. The neighbors, the community, didn't know who it was, what this place was, because the military personnel going in and out of the house weren't in uniform. They wore civilian clothing. The vehicles had no license tags, so the community wasn't even aware it was an American facility. At House Waldorf, in June 1952, the CIA begins conducting brainwashing experiments using various drugs, hypnosis, and probably torture. One of the top secret protocols documents a Russian agent being pumped full of medication. The goal of the experiments is to manipulate the human mind in order to extract secrets from its subjects and then to erase their memory so they can't remember what happened to them. Dr. Frank Olson arrived in Frankfurt on June 12, 1952, from Hendon Military Airport near London. He left the Rhine Mine region three days later, on June 15. On June 13, experiments are conducted with patient number two, a suspected Soviet double agent. I he was trouble after he came back from Germany one time. He came back and he told me, he said, Norm, I'll tell you right now, you and I never talked about this, but hey, 
you know, we're, we're both grown-ups, and this was rough. He said, Norm, you would be stunned by the techniques that they used. They made people talk. They brainwashed people. They used uh, all kinds of drugs, they, all kinds of uh, torture. The CIA's unscrupulous experiments on human beings continued the Nazi drug experiments they learned of during the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp. They were using Nazis. They were using prisoners. They were using Russians. And they didn't care whether or not they came out of it or not. Meanwhile, the U.S. Army was conducting extensive experiments with a new miracle drug, LSD. Here, for example, a soldier was expected to assemble a rifle while under the influence of the hallucinogen. The Army's LSD experiments took place on the campus of the Chemical Corps in Edgewood Arsenal. The scientists who worked in these laboratories in the early 50s and who collaborated closely with Frank Olson were looking for new hallucinogenic substances. They hoped to find a way to use the drugs on the battleground. A chemist from former Nazi Germany, Dr. Fritz Hoffmann, had been hired a few years earlier to spur the search for new behavior modifying substances. Immediately after the war, he courted the Americans, seeking to ensure a job in the United States. There was an interest in, in the U.S. during that time in uh, looking at uh, mood altering drugs uh, from LSD to um, conucleo methyl dimensilate and other um, possible mood altering drugs. Um, Fritz was, in, was interested in that area as well. Several weeks later, on a windy... After its experiments on soldiers, the Army saw potential in using LSD and other drugs to sedate and dope enemy troops. In short order, it would be possible to conquer territory without a fight. His physical actions were noticeably slower. A short time later, the CIA begins conducting its own LSD experiments in the Bohemian New York neighborhood of Greenwich Village on Bedford Street. But unlike the Army experiments, the subjects of these tests, which took place in an apartment disguised as a brothel, would not be informed. The CIA hired prostitutes to pour LSD into their customers' drinks and then lure them into revealing secrets. My purpose was to see that we got guys up there who we wanted to talk and through other people we got prostitutes to come in and speak to these guys. And these prostitutes would put something which I found out later on was LSD into the drink and make them talk. Either they wanted to talk about narcotics, security or crime. This was all part of the CIA experiment. They called it dirty tricks. LSD, it was soon learned, was a much more effective way to loosen the tongue than alcohol was. Deep Creek Lake in Western Maryland, a three hour drive from Washington. In an isolated vacation house at the edge of the lake, the CIA's Dirty Tricks Department converged here for a meeting with 10 of its scientists in November 1953. The meeting is about artichoke. According to the invitation, it was a conference for sports journalists. But in reality, the participants, one of them Frank Olson, were to be placed under the influence of LSD. One of the drinks has been spiked. Later, it will be said the CIA was conducting a kind of self-test, but without the knowledge of the participants. I don't think, again, from what I heard, that he was drugged because he was a security agent. He was drugged because he talked too much. 
When Frank Holson was later briefed about the LSD experiment, he knew immediately what it meant. They had interrogated him with artichoke techniques. Friday evening, he came home and spent the weekend, you know, in this house with, with, with my mother and brother and sister and me. And during much of that weekend, they sat on a sofa, which was just over here. And it was a, it was a foggy November weekend, as she described it. And they sort of sat there uh, holding hands and uh, kind of staring out these big windows into the fog. And uh, he described uh, having made something he referred to as a terrible mistake. The CIA brings Olson, accompanied by an agent, to New York. In the hotel, they are joined by a doctor working for the Secret Service who administers medication. Frank Olson has become a security risk, but it seems the CIA has already found a solution. There, there, Forty years later, at the Institute for Forensic Medicine at George Washington University, the body of Dr. Frank Olson has been exhumed and is undergoing an autopsy. Eric wants clarity once and for all. And as it turns out, the results of the first autopsy in 1953 in New York were manipulated. A report from New York City in the medical examiner's office, uh, which I had before me, was totally inaccurate in some very important respects. It talked about lacerations, cuts of the flesh, uh, that in all probability might have been caused by, by glass in the, in the course of his fall. Um, there were no lacerations. They were not there. Totally non-existent. We also noticed immediately that he had a, uh, uh, a hemorrhage, which we call a hematoma. Uh, it's what we call a, a subgaleal hematoma, which is under the, under the skull by the frontal bone. That in, is only reasonable, reasonably explainable as having occurred uh, by reason of his being, uh, shall we say, silenced, uh, being... Uh, rendered uh, unable to defend himself so that he could be tossed out the window. Stars arranges to visit the Pennsylvania Hotel with Armand Pastore, the hotel manager who found Frank Olson that night. Afterwards, he makes his judgment. It is my view, and that of a number of my team members, not all of them, but a number of my team members, uh, that it was uh, homicide. That would mean Frank Olson was first knocked out by a targeted blow and then thrown out of the open hotel window. Just a few months before the murder took place, the CIA had this study of assassination prepared, a how-to book for agents on how to kill people without leaving any clues. In this report, it says, The most efficient accident in simple assassination is a fall of 75 feet or more onto a hard surface. In some cases, it will be necessary to stun or drug the subject before dropping him. What was spelled out in that assassination manual was almost letter for letter what happened to Dr. Olson. And, and it was a, a protocol, as we call it, for an assassination which fit like the fingers in a glove. So was it in fact murder? But for what reason? Why did Olson speak of a terrible mistake he had made? There's a piece missing, and I'm not sure that I'm the one to, to give it to you. But what happened was that he, he just uh, got involved in it uh, in a way that he was not happy about it, but there's nothing he could do about it. He was CIA, and they... they uh, took it to the end. Summer 1953. Frank Olson and his father-in-law cut down a tree. Then the family goes to Tupper Lake on vacation, just like every year, with Arthur Vedic, his wife, and their children. Everything seems the same as always, but that appearance is deceiving. Frank is troubled by something, and he makes an attempt to confide in his brother-in-law, Art. I'd never had a conversation with him. 
about anything that might have involved moral values. What startled me about it was that he had mentioned the Bible and that he was struggling with something. You knew that there was a problem that he was attempting to confront, but what that problem was, I didn't know. I can visualize his face, actually. It was drawn in a way I'd never seen him before. While the family enjoys summertime at the lake, Frank retreats into his own world. My mother also recalled that, that my, my father was short-tempered during that last, last summer and that uh, she knew uh, that he had been going through some kind of crisis. I mean, she knew he hadn't been sleeping well and she knew he wasn't really at peace. He had been agitated and, and uh, you know, worried about something and had, you know, from time to time discussed uh, leaving Dietrich, leaving his job and, and retraining himself as a dentist. Uh, and she had encouraged him to do this, if, if that's what he wanted to do. In Asia at the time, a bitter war was going on between Allied U.S. troops against the North Koreans and Chinese. It had already been going on for three years. It was the first long-awaited and long-feared battle between the West and communism. Could the Korean War have anything to do with Frank's personal problems? He still has an office here in Fort Detrick in the U.S. Army Center for Biological Weapons. At the same time, he is working for the CIA. Among the tasks of the Dirty Tricks Department in Building 1412 are brainwashing, drugs, and torture, as well as murder by means of poisons and bacteria. On July 17, 1953, Olson celebrates his 43rd birthday with friends. A few days later, he leaves for the last trip he will ever take. He took his movie camera. First stop, London. First objects filmed, Big Ben and a parade on the mall. Then on to Paris. Near the Eiffel Tower, his two CIA colleagues sit in a sidewalk cafe and watch pretty French girls go by. On the left is John McNulty. Paris, London, Stockholm. Frank will later write on the packaging. His son Eric is seeing his father's last film for the first time in his memory. Then, suddenly, a picture of the ruins of the Reichstag and Brandenburg Gate. The Soviet memorial for the victims of the Second World War. So Frank Olsen was also in Berlin early in August 1953. In Seelendorf, he photographs the headquarters of the American army. Is Frank Olsen on a secret artichoke mission? Several top-level communist agents were being interrogated in Berlin at the time. It was a time of intense political and military tension in the divided city, just weeks after the civilian uprising in the Soviet sector. At the army headquarters in Berlin, Olsen apparently witnessed brutal interrogation methods. Uh, when he came back from Germany the last time, he sounded different. When he talked to me, he said, I, I can probably tell you things that I can't tell other people because you're still in, in top secret material, but the people that he saw in Germany went to the extreme. And he said, Norm, did you ever see a man die? And I said, no. And he said, well, I did. They did die. Some of the people that were interrogated died. So you can imagine the amount of, of uh, work that they were doing on these people. He said that he was going to leave. He told me that. He says, I'm getting out of that CIA, period. 
In Korea, it's just a matter of days before the first American prisoners of war will be released. Some of them will face charges of high treason because they accuse their own country of conducting biological warfare. When my son asked me what I did in Korea, how can I tell him that I came over here and dropped germ bombs on people, destroying and bringing death and destruction? How can I go back and face my family? Are their accusations accurate, or are they themselves the victims of communist brainwashing? One thing is for certain, back home in freedom, the soldiers making these confessions will be interrogated again, using drugs and torture by their own people. All hands agreed that among the returning POWs from Korea, the hardcore group and those who had been successfully indoctrinated were excellent subjects for artichoke work. The American soldiers who claimed to have committed biological warfare were apparently manipulated using artichoke techniques. This is documented in CIA papers and indeed all discredited their confessions. I did sign a confession relating to germ warfare, but the statements contained in this confession were false. They were obtained under duress from the Chinese Communist and by making these statements, I deliberately attempted to put in as much as was false and ridiculous as I could possibly get away with. I took an oath when I left the army. I wouldn't talk about that. I'm sorry. The Korean War Memorial in Washington honors the Americans who died in that fight. Of those who returned, some were interrogated by the CIA using cruel methods and forced to rescind their confessions. But were the confessions the truth? Did the Americans in fact use biological weapons in the Korean War? As a test? And was this the secret Frank Olson knew and might disclose? This fits with what my mother had always said, Korea really bothered your father. Finally, when, when one of my father's colleagues, you know, within the past year only, told me that, you know, my father had come to understand that Korea was the, was the key thing and, that, and that, that they were using biological warfare methods in Korea. So, and then I proceeded to ask him, well, what about the germ warfare confessions? That this was, you know, this was alleged to be by the American government. These confessions made by the American servicemen were, were immediately discredited with, under the idea that these were manipulated and produced only by the effect of brainwashing. And at that point, my father's colleague looked at me and he said, as if to say, read my lips, he said, it wasn't all brainwashing. Would this colleague, Norman Kuhnoyer, repeat this statement in front of the camera? He has never made a public statement, neither about Frank Olson nor about biological warfare in the Korean War. Will he, now in his 80s, pay last respects to his old friend Frank Olson and to Frank's son Eric, who takes part in this conversation? I took an oath when I left the United States Army that I would never divulge that type of stuff. You I, can't divulge it to me. You can't prove it, can you? I can assert I can it. I mean, you, you told me. Here, say it. So you don't want to say it? No. I don't want to say it. But there were people who had biological weapons, and they used them. I won't say any more than that. They what? used them. Was there a reason for your dad being killed by the CIA? Probably so. Around Frederick, Maryland, where Frank Olson lived while working for both the U.S. Army's secret biological warfare program and the CIA, the FBI is still looking for the anthrax terrorist. For months, the largest investigation in the history of American criminal justice has been underway. Should the perpetrator be accused and the case come to court, the government in Washington might be forced to reveal what Eric Olson believes is top secret information about illegal research on biological weapons, about the use of anthrax in the Korean War, 
and about his father's murder. Eric wants to tell his friend Bruce about the latest evidence. Bruce has been at his side throughout his years of research. Once in the summer of 1975, the American government didn't hesitate to see to it that the truth was not made known. The conspiracy originated at the top, in the White House, initiated by Donald Rumsfeld and Richard Cheney. It had just been learned that the CIA allegedly drugged its employee Frank Olson with LSD before his supposed suicide. Rumsfeld and Cheney, heads of the White House Chiefs of Staff, at the time recommended to President Gerald Ford that he apologize to the family in the name of the government and to support retribution in order to prevent worse things from happening. That's the content of this White House memo. There is the possibility that it might be necessary to disclose highly classified national security information in connection with any court suit or legislative hearings. Ten days later, Ford hosted the Olson family and apologized. This allowed him to remain silent about state secrets and the true reasons for Frank Olson's death. What this means for me is that, you know, national security homicide is not only a possibility, but really it's a necessity when you have a certain number of ingredients together. If you're doing top secret work that is immoral, arguably immoral, especially in the post-Nuremberg period, and arguably illegal, uh, and at odds with the kind of high moral position that you're trying to maintain in the world, uh, you have to have a mechanism of security which is going to include murder. The two politicians who collaborated in the conspiracy in 1975, Rumsfeld and Cheney, are back in power as Vice President and Secretary of Defense of the Government of the United States. The Frank Olson case, it seems, is far from closed, even 50 years later. That, at least, is one thing of which Olson's son is now certain. <laughs>